So hello everybody, this is Donna Hoffman. I'm a professor of political science and this is a short little video on the congressional elections of 2020. It's really easy in a presidential election year to forget um, that it's not just the president that we're voting on. And in fact, when we vote for the president, we're just voting for electors anyway. But when we vote for our members of Congress, we're voting directly for them, unlike the presidency. But oftentimes in a presidential election, sometimes we forget about those congressional races. And arguably, those congressional races are maybe even more personally important for individuals because you're electing your representatives that are closest to you. You're a House member every two years. And then, depending on the election year, maybe a senator in this year, 2020, in Iowa, um, we are electing a senator, so we have that race as well. But let's look at the big picture and let's look at where we stand with congressional elections. So going into the election with the House of Representatives, there's 232 Democrats, there's 197 Republicans, there's one Libertarian, and there's five vacancies. The Democrats since 2018 have controlled the House of Representatives. Party control in Congress is very important because it means you get uh, the chairs of all the committees and subcommittees, you get a majority on all the committees and subcommittees. And then the House especially, um, it's majoritarian. So what the majority party wants, the majority party generally gets in the House of Representatives. So party control here is very important. The same is true in the Senate, but in the Senate, we have Demo or Republicans, excuse me, in control, 53 Republicans, 45 Democrats, two independents who both caucus with the Democrats. So essentially it's 53-47. So it's very close. Again, party is, control, uh, party is important here because of the control of the chamber. Now the Senate is not quite as majoritarian as the House is, but nevertheless, if you can be the majority party, you wanna be the majority party because you get the chairs of all the committees and the subcommittees uh, and, you, uh, and things work by majority rule for the most part in the Senate, even though we have the filibuster, but we'll set that aside. So that's where we are going into the elections. Let's talk about what we are doing then um, in the election season. So for the House of Representatives, all 435 seats are up. This happens every two years. This is one of the features that's in the Constitution to keep the House of Representatives closest to the people, directly elected, and every two years, everybody is up. But the state of things in the United States uh, with House seats is that Every two years, most of them are not competitive, and this year is no different. So in this cycle, there are only 344, um, or excuse me, there are 344 seats that aren't competitive. They're either solid Democratic or solid Republican seats. That's 79% of the seats in the House of Representatives. Now, there are about 60 that are the most competitive. These are the 26 toss-up seats, um, and then the other ones that lean towards one party or another. And so these are the ones in particular that we are watching. There's another 31 seats that are somewhat competitive. These are typically labeled likely Democratic or likely Republican. And then there are um, uh, those most competitive ones that we are watching. Now, current um, examinations of what the House will look like after this election, this is from 538, they run simulations and in 96 of the 100 scenarios that they have run, most recently, the Democrats will keep the House. So that's pretty high uh, likelihood that the Democrats will still control the House of Representatives after the uh, November election. In the Senate though, remember our control is um, in the hands of the Republicans. Now the Senate every two years is only one third uh, up. And so this is what we call class two. There's three classes in the Senate. So the people who are in class two, the senators who are in class two, they are the ones up for reelection this cycle. It's only one third of the Senate. Now, actually this, uh, this cycle, there's 35 seats that are up um, because we have a special election in Georgia. So we have an additional seat there um, and we have a, a special election in um, uh, Arizona as well. So normally there would be 33 seats here, but we have 35. But there are 65 seats then that are not up for re-election. This provides us with continuity in the Senate, according to the, the scheme of the Constitution. Um, and we then 
um, only have one third of the Senate up. Now, the Republicans are defending 23 seats in this cycle. 10 of those are safe. They're gonna stay in Republican hands unless something really odd would happen. The Democrats are only defending 12. This is kind of the reverse of the situation that we um, had in 2018 where the Democrats were defending more seats than the Republicans were. So in this cycle, the Republicans are defending more seats than the Democrats are. Just like the Republicans though, 10 of those are safe. Um, and so you'll see there are more uh, toss up seats um, on the Republican side, if you do the math there, than on the Democratic side. And so of the continuing senators, 30 of them are Republicans, 35 of them are going to be uh, the Democrats. And if we look at the um, notion here of changing control because the Senate is very much in play, the Democrats need to net three seats um, if they win the presidency. If they lose the presidency, they need to net four seats. And this is because um, that it could be a 50-50 Senate if they net three seats, but if uh, Kamala Harris is the vice president, she's the president of the Senate, she would vote in a tie. However, if Trump is reelected, Vice President Pence would continue to be president of the Senate and Democrats to control things would need to pick up four seats. Now the odds are here in 74 of 100 scenarios that 538 has the Democrats win control. So those are pretty good odds for uh, the Democrats as it stands right now. Now let's talk about Iowa because Iowa is a swing state. Um, and not only are we a swing state in terms of presidential elections, which I'll talk about elsewhere, but we tend to have competitive congressional elections and most states do not have that. And so this is a really important feature of Iowa and something that makes Iowa uh, quite a bit different. So let's look at the house races in Iowa first. We have four house seats. Three of the four are competitive. Now remember, there were just uh, a, a small number of house seats that are competitive across the nation and we have three of those. And so three of our four seats are competitive. In the first district of Iowa, we have freshman uh, member of Congress, Abby Finkenauer, she's a Democrat. It's her first reelection cycle. This is when you're most endangered. Ashley Henson is running against her as the Republican. This is uh, two females running in this particular race and that's a little uh, unusual. This is a toss up. In the Iowa second district, it is what we call an open seat. Dave Loebsack, a Democrat currently holds this seat. And so no incumbent here. And we have Rita Hart, the Democrat, and Marianne Miller Meeks, the Republican running in this particular race. This is also seen as a toss up. And then we have Iowa three. And here we have Cindy Axney, who's a freshman Democrat like Abby Finkenauer. They are both first elected in 2018. And her opponent is David Young, who used to be the person that held this seat, um, but Axney defeated him in 18 and he's back challenging her. So he's the Republican. This one is competitive, but it's actually a lean Democrat. It started out as a toss up, but it has changed rankings and it's a lean Democrat now. And then we have the Iowa fourth district, also an open seat. This is the district currently that Steve King holds. Uh, he's a Republican, but Randy Feenstra, the Republican in this race defeated um, Steve King in the June 3rd primary. And so this is an open seat. Uh, J.D. Shulton, the Democrat and Randy Feenstra. Um, this is seen as a solid Republican seat um, because it's Western Iowa um, and it is uh, probably a pretty sure game or keep, I should say, for the Republicans. But uh, it was competitive in 2018 because King was in it and Shulton was the opponent here. And Shulton has a money advantage in this seat as well. However, were this to go blue, so to speak, um, it would really be uh, a really, really good night for the Democrats um, if that were to happen. Now let's turn our attention over to the Senate because we do have a Senate race in Iowa this year. And that of course is another freshman Senator, Joni Ernst, except she was elected first in 2014. And she's running against the Democrat, Teresa Greenfield. And this is seen as a toss up Senate race. And so it's one of the most watched Senate races lots and lots of money coming into this particular race um, as well. So this is definitely one everyone in the country um, is watching. Now, when it comes to uh, looking at, at the results of the congressional elections, um, there's two trends that uh, I in particular will be interested in. 
And one of these is what we've seen developing uh, over the last several cycles of what we call the rural urban divide. Will that rural urban divide persist? Will it grow? Here is a chart um, from City Lab. Uh, this is a uh, group that, that um, does some journalistic um, studies of con congressional races. And this is 2018. And here you see um, they divided the districts based on population density um, in 2018. And the ones that were purely urban had the most population density uh, were won by Democrats. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, those that were, uh, as they termed them, purely rural were won mostly by Republicans. And you see the mix there. And the big news in 2018 was that the suburban growth there of uh, Democratic chances in those suburban races. And so in 2020, this is another thing we are watching. How will the suburbs go? Will Democrats continue to gain ground there? So that's one thing to watch. The second thing um, is, the will there be the continued nationalization of elections? And so what this means is, um, and here this particular chart is just looking at the Senate, um, but this is also true of House races, but we'll focus on the Senate here. Um, over the years, most Senate races have tended to go the same way that the state presidential um, vote goes. And you'll see there there's a little spike in 2016, but that's because it pretty much topped out at 100%. You'll notice though the overall trend there, even though it declined in 18, was still very high, 77. And, um, and the overall growth there, or overall trend there is one of growth. And so what we typically you know, are saying in relationship to the Iowa Senate race, for example, is if Trump wins, this, wins the state, probably Joni Ernst is reelected. However, however, if Trump loses the state, uh, probably Joni Ernst goes down in defeat. And this is uh, because a fewer voters are doing what we call splitting their tickets, voting for uh, a Democrat here, a Republican there. Um, they are voting straight tickets, one party all the way down at least in terms of those top two that we're looking at here, uh, in, in particular, the Senate uh, and the, the presidency. And so these are two things that we're gonna be watching. Now, if you watch election results for Congress on election night, there's some things to keep in mind here. Uh, and the major one is be patient. And this, is, this will go for the presidential race too, but here we're just gonna focus on Congress. But let me give you an idea of why you need to be patient. Don't be dismayed if on election night, returns are de delayed. This is a normal state of affairs. Um, we, we fixate again on the presidential race, um, but again, congressional races, we have to count all the ballots. And in particular in 2020, when um, the COVID pandemic is going on, many more people are going to be voting absentee or going to be voting by mail. And it may take some states longer than other states to count them. Another factor here is that states have different rules in terms of how long they let ballots come in and do they need to be postmarked and when they can they start counting them. And so this makes for a, um, a lot of different things going on on election night. So let me give you just one example of why you should be patient, especially when it comes to congressional results. Uh, but this goes for the presidential results too. Um, and again, that this is not uh, unusual. This is a normal state of affairs. So let's just use 2018 as an example here. In 2018, there's no presidential race. What we are really watching especially are um, the House and the Senate because control um, in 2018 in the House did shift to the Democrats. The Republicans held on to the Senate. But in 2018 in the midterm, for example, California uh, usually is very late to report. And if there are close races in California, uh, they wait uh, until they can definitively say who won. And so um, on election night in 2018, as we were trying to assess what was happening, it was clear that the Democrats won the House of Representatives, uh, but it didn't look like there was a blue wave materializing. So on the early morning, or basically in the evening uh, of election uh, night, the Dems had picked up 26 seats, pretty good not a blue wave, some of the pundits said. One week, but there were a lot of races still out. One week after election night, the Democrats had picked up 34 seats. And at the end of it all, the Democrats picked up 40 seats. And that last seat, that 40th seat, was not known until the very end of November. And in fact, it was from California. So 
in close races, it takes time to count those. And that is not indicative of any kind of nefariousness going on. Uh, it is um, the people who count ballots doing due diligence to make sure that their ballots are in and that they are counted and that they are securely reported. And so don't be alarmed if we don't know the state of play for Congress, for example, because in close elections, we might have to wait. Another factor um, is that there are um, two states uh, that do things a little bit differently. This pertains especially to the Senate. The Senate is very, very close. Um, there's a special election in Georgia, and there's also a regular election in Georgia for uh, the Senate. So there's two Senate seats up. One is a special election. They have different rules. The special election seat in Georgia, um, if there is a, a, not a majority winner in that race, and there are a number of candidates on the ballot, multiple Democrats, multiple Republicans, because that's how they do their special elections. If nobody wins a majority outright on November 3rd, that would go to a special election that wouldn't take place until January 5th in Georgia. Louisiana always uses um, this kind of election for theirs, and they have a Senate seat up as well. It's probably not competitive. Uh, however, if the Republican incumbent were not to get 50% there, it would go to a runoff too. Their runoff though would be December 6th. So um, be patient because uh, in the United States, we have a federal system, states are um, charged with administering their elections and they have different rules and different things going on, which makes reporting on elections sometimes very challenging. So not knowing the state of play on election night is not um, a, a tragedy. Um, it is not even unusual and just remember that. So I hope you learned just a little bit about congressional elections here. And I hope that you will watch uh, on election night and beyond uh, as we determine who our representatives are going to be.